Hi everybody, thanks for waiting um, and thank you for joining us today. So again, my name is Anthony Kyriakidis. I work at the Energy Saving Trust in the Renewables team and welcome. Today's webinar is going to be focusing on energy storage. Um, the webinar is part of a series of webinars we're delivering. Um, the work's funded by the Scottish Government as part of their support for home renewables, energy efficiency and obviously now storage. And there's um, other support from the Scottish Government to, to help householders with their energy bills and carbon emissions and wider aims about uh, meeting climate change targets and building a lower carbon economy. Um, I'll do some of the, the uh, logistical stuff first and some general points about the webinar. So you can hear us, but we can't hear you. And that's perfectly normal for webinars. Um, we think the webinar will be about 45 minutes and there should be an opportunity at the end um, for us to take some questions. Um, you can ask questions at any time through your control panel, which you should be able to see on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we also want to hear your views um, during this. Um, and um, we'll be recording the webinar, so we'll be able to circulate it to you afterwards. Um, and then we'll, we'll also put it on our YouTube channel, and I'll mention that in a second. Um, with regard to our program for today, um, we've got a couple of speakers for you. Um, we'll first be um, hearing from Peter Randall. He's uh, the director of Solar Kingdom, um, but is also um, uh, an owner of a electrical battery, which, and he's going to talk more from the perspective of his own experience of, of um, installing and living with a battery system connected to his PV system. So that, that should be really interesting. Um, and we've also got one of our own, Pantelis Stefas, who, who's our um, one of our insight and analytics consultants, and he'll be talking a bit more about market trends in domestic electricity storage. Um, after that, we'll we'll have some questions and answers. Um, so just a brief introduction from me, really. Um, we first did a webinar on energy storage just under a year ago. Um, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, it's pretty useful for, if you haven't seen that, it's pretty useful for you to find that afterwards. And I've put a link here um, that you can follow. Um, what we went through there is some, some of the basics around domestic energy storage. So what we don't want to do is repeat all of that. But it's useful background. Um, and the main message uh, for me coming out um, coming out of that is is that there's information on our website. Um, so you can listen to the webinar and on our website we've got an energy storage page. Um, here's the link to that where you can start reading in a bit more detail if you haven't already about what energy storage is. And, and what I'd like to highlight at the beginning is that you've really got two types of domestic energy storage at the moment. You've got domestic energy storage that will provide heated water and you've got domestic energy storage that will provide electricity. Um, keep both of those things in mind. A lot of our conversation today is going to be around um, energy storage that will provide electricity power to your home. Um, but there are um, energy storage devices out there that will provide heated water to you. So you need to have a think about what it is that you want to actually get out of this system. Um, on the heated water side of things, there's, there's, there's two main areas. One, it could just be as basic as a hot water cylinder and you connect that to your PV system. And when you've got excess electricity, you can use that to heat the water in your in your hot water tank. There's also more modern and sophisticated ways of um, providing hot water through an energy storage system. Uh, and the main one that we're aware of is something based on phase change materials. Sounds quite fancy, but actually it's the type of things you see in those little gel warmers, uh, just a, a more sophisticated version of that. Um, they basically can be charged up from heated water or from electricity, um, can be linked to a renewable systems, so either an air source heat pump or, for example, a PV system, and they'll put out mains, hot, mains pressure hot water when you need it. And then the, the side that gets a lot more attention is the electrical batteries. And there's many manufacturers out there who are providing these now, all lots of big names, um, Tesla, 
Nissan, for example, or a car manufacturer, electric car manufacturer, who also do home batteries and all manner of different types of manufacturers, some of whom have been in the market for quite a while, particularly in Germany. So there's a lot more choice choice out there. Um, I That's probably it from me for the moment as a basic introduction. Really, we want to be hearing from Peter and Pantelis next. Um, so over to Peter. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Peter Randall. Uh, I'm here not only on behalf of myself as a business, but also as an active member of Solar Trade Association and particularly Solar Trade Association Scotland. Just to come on, I'm going to talk to you about a real life uh, case, which is my own home. And just to show there's nothing new, this picture dates from 1916. Um, I'm afraid I can't afford a man in a shed, but there we are. This um, is the home in question. A hundred years later, this is the reality. This is the arrays on my own home. The array covers three roofs. It's not ideally sited, but um, part of what we did here was to show that you can achieve good output um, with a little bit of imagination. This is the culprit we're here really to talk about. This is the first Tesla power wall that was installed in Scotland. Um, that was the 28th of May, 2016. Um, just to go on, what is important is really to say, does it work? And the results will show this. It's generating empirical data to show it works. And most importantly, from any prospective customer's point of view, it lets us understand how the variables affect the performance. So here is a day in April 2017. This graph shows the energy consumption in the property over a 24 hour period. Um, you can spot the cups of coffee that we had by each of those spikes. That's every time the kettle boiled. This is pretty typical for a UK household. There's a bit of a bump at the bottom uh, when we got up and then there's the normal evening peak. This is called a load profile and you can see that day we used 11.34 kilowatt hours. On the same day, here is the production from the PV system. It generated nearly 16 kilowatt hours of energy. Here we have one overlaid on the other. The area that is slightly darkened is um, where the PV system supplied the electricity for the property. You can also see a lot of the energy was simply exported from the property and the red area is where electricity was drawn from the grid. Now, let's put in the battery. You can see here, self-consumption was quite high, 69% of the generated electricity was used and of the total electricity that was used in the house 97 percent came from the solar and the battery at the bottom there you can see the level of charge of the battery now not every day is like this as you can imagine either due to seasonalization the time of the year or even the weather but it does show what is possible OK, this graph is simply to show even with all that, that light green area, the system still exported some electricity. So let's look at this in a slightly different way. This is an energy balance for the property for the whole year. Um, as you can see in the summer, the yellow area is the PV production uh, is meeting more of the total need. The blue is what was exported from the property and the orange at the bottom is what was purchased from the grid. Now that there is the date at which the battery was installed and you can see the dramatic drop off in imported electricity and even at the end of the year when the PV system is producing a lot less electricity you can see that the import is lower. I'll just um, show you 12 months figures with the battery, which maybe gives you a better representation. Um, you can see much higher use of the PV with the battery 
in the summer there is still excess being imported. Uh, wouldn't it be great just to be able to shift that around and I'm sure one day we'll be able to. So here are some results. Without the, the battery, the Tesla Powerwall, we were self-consuming 35% of the generated electricity, 65% of the generated electricity was being exported to the grid. With the battery, only 37% was exported and 63% was self-used. Just moving on from that, it's important to re remember that our electricity usage is not static and the same each month. We use more in winter than we do in summer. Things like lights, occasional downflow heaters in your new bathroom, all sorts of areas. So that is actually uh, in the same house. More importantly, I want to move on to what we call self-use as a contribution to total use. Self-sufficiency, what is the bottom line? Because of the design of the system that I have, where it produces about the same amount of electricity that we use, it may not be completely typical. But without the Tesla, we were importing about 64 and we self-used about 36%. With the battery, quite a turnaround. The imported electricity is 39% and the self-used, I'm sorry about this, we seem to have a technical glitch, the self-used is 61%. Now, there will be a set of slides available um, outside of this webinar, giving other examples showing um, different system sizes and different uses of electricity. These figures will vary with those variables and with the size of the battery. So this, the figures you see here apply only to this particular system. Just to move on from there, there are lots of variables that affect um, performance. So we've already talked about how much electricity is generated, the output of the PV system, how much of that generated electricity is used in the profile, in, in the property, when is it used, the consumption profile, at what time of day, what is the usable size of the battery, how much energy can it hold, we have to remember that there are system losses when you charge and discharge a battery. And then quite importantly is regional variation, where you are in the country and seasonality, which I touched on before. So important to use a common language when we're talking about storage. So we all try and mean the same thing when we say something. We don't want to get lost in translation. So. Self-use of generated energy is how much of the energy produced on the roof are you using? Contribution to total usage, self-sufficiency of all the electricity you are using, how much of it is coming from the combination of the solar PV system and the battery? Really important to remember, these are not the same. They can be really quite different. Um, I'm sorry there's been a bit of a uh, problem with the slides, not quite as bad as the poor woman who had a, a wardrobe malfunction in the ice skating at the Olympics. Um, I don't think the outcome is quite as shattering, but my apologies for that. Not quite sure wh why that happened. Um, small plug for myself. This is my business and um, always happy to answer any questions either from this presentation or um, from anything else you may have. Thanks. Peter, thank you very much. Yeah, and an apology from me. Uh, it's a gremlin in PowerPoint seems to want to keep on moving to the next slide, even though we didn't quite set it up like that. So thanks for your patience. Um, you may find that this happens in Pantelis's presentation as well. He'll just quickly move back to the to the, the previous uh, point or slide if he needs to. So thank you for accommodating that. Peter, that was excellent. Um, it's just a, a really nice summary about how life with your system has been and, and the changes that you've seen. Um, we'll come back to, to Peter in, in a minute, but first we're gonna go over to Pantelis and he's gonna talk about some of the, uh, some of the, the, the bigger picture 
issues around uh, domestic scale electricity storage, some of the bigger opportunities. Um, and then we'll bring both Peter and Pantelis back together and, and, and take some questions. So Pantelis, we'll move over to you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Peter. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pantelis Stefas, and today uh, I will speak uh, about the most recent market trends in the domestic uh, scale electricity battery storage. Uh, I will focus more on the electricity battery storage sector. Uh, however, there are many interesting developments in the heat battery storage sector, which will not be covered in this presentation. Uh, so, as you might know, uh, the UK aims to decarbonize the electricity grid and uh, to do so it has specific carbon tar targets to meet uh, by 2050. Due to this, uh, it is expected that the electricity system uh, in the future will consist of low carbon generation. Uh, such as renewables, uh, which are an intermittent source of generation, or nuclear, which is an uh, inflexible source of generation. In addition to this, uh, it is uh, anticipated that the large capacity of coal and nuclear plants uh, to be decommissioned in the next decade. Uh, this will create a lack in the power capacity of the supply. Finally, uh, an increase of the electricity is also expected due to the electrification of the transport and heat. All uh, these changes in the electricity market uh, put the grid under pressure. This happens because uh, balancing demand and supply on a second-by-second -second basis is becoming more challenging and costly. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, uh, a capacity gap is created in the supply side as the, demands, the demand needs to be met even during days when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. A possible solution to this is to bring uh, flexibility in the demand side. And in particular, uh, we can do this by de deploying uh, electricity battery storage. Uh, electricity battery storage has the ability to offer flexibility by basically responding quickly to grid frequency and price market signals, uh, providing uh, energy reserves uh, by charging or discharging when needed, and finally by shifting demand out of peak periods. Uh, as you can see, although electricity battery storage has many benefits to offer to the grid, it's not broadly established yet and uh, this is possibly because it's still expensive. Um, the good news though is that it's getting cheaper. As you can see from this uh, graph, the cost of lithium mine is constantly falling and it's expected to be uh, around $200 per kilowatt hour by 2020, which is uh, about 80% less uh, than what it used to be eight years ago. Uh, the reasons behind this trend is uh, the significant growth of the EV industry and the development of the lithium-ion manufacturer industry, respectively, uh, which basically take advantage of economies of scale. Uh, so, as you can imagine, this cost reduction makes the battery storage uh, more accessible to everyone. Uh, as uh, Peter explained earlier, uh, energy storage uh, collocated with uh, microgeneration could uh, dramatically improve uh, homeowners' self-consumption and reduce their, their energy bill. Uh, this is basically the most common business model for small-scale energy storage. And uh, the UK government has realized that and they are keen to support these applications. However, uh, there are other market transitions in the electricity grid grid, which uh, could also develop new opportunities for uh, battery storage. One of those is the smart meter rollout, which uh, could facilitate uh, the establishment of this uh, technology. Uh, nowadays, there are about uh, 5 million electricity smart meters across the country, and it's expected that uh, by 2020, all domestic customers would have one very optimistic. Uh, more importantly, uh, smart meters uh, will facilitate the introduction of time of use tariffs, which could create the necessary market signals to encourage behavior change. Uh, to make it clear to you, in the following slides, I will demonstrate in a case study how a household with time of use tariffs 
could benefit from electricity battery storage. Um, in this graph, we can see uh, the daily profile of electricity usage of a typical household with a standard electricity tariff. Uh, we can see that there are two peak periods, one in the morning and another one in the evening. Uh, the electricity tariff is uh, the same across the day. And as a result, the household has no incentive at all to change its, its uh, behavior. Uh, assume now that uh, uh, the household is on a time of use tariff with uh, three price uh, periods, as you can see from this graph. Uh, it's uh, very likely that the median and high price periods will occur during uh, the morning and evening peaks. Uh, this is expected mainly because these are the time periods when the grid's total demand peaks. Uh, this means that if the consumption uh, of the household remains unchanged, uh, the electricity bill would increase. Uh, this is the, an excellent opportunity for uh, battery storage uh, to capitalize on these price differences and shift demand at low electricity prices. Uh, this can be understood from this graph where we can see that the battery storage unit can be used to charge during the low electricity price periods and discharge during peak time in order uh, to reduce uh, the grid import and uh, the electricity bills respectively. Uh, another uh, area which uh, battery storage uh, can uh, capitalize on is uh, grid, the grid balancing. As uh, we discussed earlier, uh, battery storage can contribute to the grid balancing process by grid balancing process, uh, we mean the process followed by National Grid, the system operator, to match supply and demand on a second by second basis. Uh, to do so, uh, National Grid have uh, developed a range of balancing services, this is how they called, uh, firm frequency response, enhanced frequency response and capacity market are just a few of those. Uh, so what happens in reality is that National Grid uh, uh, pays all the stakeholders who participate in these balancing mechanisms. And uh, for your reference, uh, these uh, balancing costs represent around 15% of the typical electricity bill. And only in 2017, UK's uh, flexibility market uh, had a value of one billion pounds. Uh, battery storage can contribute in this uh, balancing mechanism by tracking the frequency of the grid and charging or discharging when it's required. However, small uh, scale electricity storage units cannot directly access the balancing mechanism, mechanism uh, because they have limited capacity and they require a third party to interfere, uh, the so-called aggregator. Uh, the role of the aggregator is to basically group together and manage uh, multiple uh, small scale batteries. Uh, this aggregated load looks like a virtual power plant uh, on the grid level and uh, it is capable to sell grid services to the system operator. Uh, so how uh, this virtual power plant works in reality can be seen from this picture where it shows that the aggregator can access the distributed energy storage units remotely, uh, control them and manage them in such a way to help balancing the grid. And finally, uh, they reimburse the household for the services provided. Uh, so to sum up uh, with everything, uh, battery storage can offer multiple environmental and economic benefits. Uh, both to the society and the individuals. Uh, on the society level, uh, battery storage can uh, facilitate the higher penetration of the renewables, can uh, reduce uh, the grid losses, offer security of supply and grid reliability. Uh, it, it can help uh, to reduce the balancing cost and also it uh, can be deployed faster than a centralized uh, power plant. On the individual uh, level, uh, battery storage can help a uh, household to reduce its uh, carbon footprint uh, and uh, its uh, electricity bills respectively. And uh, also uh, it's a good opportunity to add uh, additional revenue streams in the household. Uh, 
thank you very much for your time. Pantelis, brilliant. Um, thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of new um, information and, and potentially um, terminology that some people may not be aware of. Um, but I think it's useful for people to start getting their heads around what what the future may hold. And I think that's that's probably one of the key messages here. There's a lot of information, a lot of new stories, uh, lots of ideas, lots of potential. And, you know, we're going to have to see where some of this leads us to. Um, what I'm going to quickly do now is, um, is basically open things up to questions. Um, but before we ask the first question, I just wanted to, to raise a point that one of our listeners has, has, has sent through to us. And I'll read it out because I think it's just it's, it's interesting. It basically says, I have joined um, the webinar as I've recently upgraded my solar to a, a 6.4 kilowatt system. I've bought an electric car. I've installed a Zappi charger and I've installed a Tesla Powerwall 2 battery. I'm now running without the grid, uh, full solar and um, Powerwall 2 usage for two days in Scotland in February. Um, and the, the person who wrote this basically said, this may be of interest to those on the call. So I think it's, it sort of demonstrates some of the possibilities that, that are available to people. Um, as for questions, um, we've got a question about um, comparing energy storage solutions. So basically someone's asked, um, and I'll, I'll direct this probably to Peter, someone's asked about a uh, comparison of installing a, um, a uh, an electrical battery versus installing um, an Imasun unit, which is a diverter. It basically diverts your electricity from a PV, for example, a PV system, instead of it going out to the grid, it diverts it into a hot water tank. Um, what sort of comparative ease of installing that type of a system with a diverter compared to installing an electrical battery? Um, and what are the, maybe the cost comparisons as well? Okay, um, I'll jump straight in first with the idea of diverting heat into hot water. Um, using a device like an Imerson or there are several others on the market out there. Um, first thing you need to consider is what is your cost displacement? If you're on gas, you're probably paying about four pence per kilowatt hour of gas. Um, and that would be what you would be saving by taking your electrical energy and heating your water with it. If you're heating by electricity and you're on something like economy seven, then the saving is going to be significantly higher. You may be paying uh, eight or nine pence per unit. If you already have a hot water cylinder, um, fitting a device like an Emerson, and I'll look at the, the more high quality, high end units, um, then the cost is going to be in the hundreds. If you don't have a hot water cylinder, and let's say you have a combi boiler, things are going to get a lot more complicated. You've got to look at the cost of the hot water cylinder and how that is going to be integrated into the system. With a combi boiler, you have to look at what's the maximum um, inlet temperature you can have of hot water, um, unless it is what we call a solar compatible one, uh, you may only able be able to put water in at 26 degrees so if you've heated the water you then have to mix it back down if it wasn't completely hot enough or else you've got to be able to divert it it gets quite complicated it's going to put the cost up it won't be the same capital cost as a battery but you do need to look at the efficacy with a battery you are directly substituting for electricity you would have bought from the grid at anywhere between I don't know at the moment 12 and 16 pence the capital cost is going to be much higher it is in the thousands um, if you were looking at a high-end unit it could be as high as six thousand pounds you need to look at the life of it you need to look at how much excess energy you've got available there's a whole sum and equation that needs to be gone through hopefully with an installer who can provide this information to you to allow you to make a reasoned decision. Um, again, we heard about a gentleman who has an electric vehicle. 
and not wishing to speak against myself because I'd love to sell you a battery, do not forget that an electric vehicle is just a battery on wheels. Well, it's a bit more. Um, I'm sorry if that sounds a bit vague, but in all of this, it's about the detail and without the detail, you can't make a reasoned decision. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. And I think it's also worth pointing out there that um, we've compared there sort of the, the sort of cheaper end of the of the, the spectrum with the, um, a diverter uh, into an, essentially an existing hot water tank to the, probably the, the more costly end, which is sort of electrical batteries. It also, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's, there's heat batteries as well. So if you're looking into this, um, you may want to look into the costs of those as well, as well if you're trying to make these comparisons. Um, so we've had a couple of questions around heat pumps come in. Um, the main thing being, can a bat uh, an electrical battery run a an air source heat pump? Um, uh, Peter, have you got anything to, to mention on this? Or um, Yes, I will. Very quickly, it's quite an easy question. If you look at the seasonal production from a PV system with or without battery storage, and look at the seasonal heat demand of uh, a heat pump, you will find there are only two shoulder periods in the year where it is likely there would be any excess from the PV that could make a contribution to running the heat pump. Um, one day I do fully believe that we will have seasonal uh, storage of energy and it may happen quicker than we think. But as of today, uh, they're not mutually exclusive, but there is not a great deal of crossover. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, you may find that if you've got a wind turbine, then that will be better matched um, because typically you'll probably be getting more production in in the sort of autumn winter months than you would with a PV system. And this is the importance of, as Peter mentioning, chatting to to people who work on these things, uh, installers in the market, and working out um, what are your what are your options based on what you what you've already got and what you're wanting to do. Um, I'm, there's a couple of questions here about um, typically about electrical storage um, and uh, this is to do with uh, sizing and also when, when these things can work so a typical question that we often hear is whether an electrical battery will work during a power cut um, Peter. the answer to this is yes it can the first question I always ask is when did you last have a power cut and then I'll also ask you how long did it last? We can um, fit a device to some batteries, not all, that will allow it to cut in should you have a, a power cut. There is quite a bit of complexity in terms of the electrical installation to do that. Whilst the, the piece of equipment itself um, only costs hundreds, what would need to be done in terms of the electrical configuration of the house can be quite complex. You would also need to ask yourself, what proportion of the storage capacity of the battery do you want to hold in reserve for that power cut you may have once a year? If it's more frequent, then that may be a, a slightly different issue. Um, typically in a house, you would look also at having to isolate those circuits that provide, um, we'll call them the vital services, maybe lights, uh, maybe um, your fridge, um, and look at just powering those. If you say, I want to power my whole house, the period of time that you have from a typical battery may not be that long. But if um, we look at most power outages in Scotland, with a few exceptions, they're pretty short. Um, there may actually be cheaper solutions to um, things like emergency lighting than having some form of switch over and reconfiguration of your electrics? The answer is yes, it can, but ask yourself, is it really worthwhile? Okay, thank you. Um, there's, uh, again, a question about electrical battery here. How um, capable are they of supplying, for example, the draw on a, on a kettle um, 
or potentially even on a heat pump um, at that sort of peak load? This will depend on both the battery and its configuration. All battery systems have a maximum charge and discharge rate. The charge rate of its from PV will be governed by the amount of electricity generated. The discharge rate can be dependent on how it's configured in terms of regulatory requirements from there being no possibility of it ever exporting to the grid. Um, if we take something like the Tesla Powerwall 2, it will discharge at up to five kilowatts, which is far in excess of your kettle, which is three kilowatts. Um, a lot of batteries will only discharge at two and a half kilowatts. Having said that, um, you may find that your three kilowatt kettle doesn't actually draw three kilowatts. So again, it's looking at what is typical of electricity draw in the house? What is peak load? Um, maybe if your biggest peak load is a three kilowatt kettle, go and buy a two kilowatt one. They are available. Thanks, Peter. And it's probably fair to say with things like an S or C pump, they're going to have a higher load than um, a kettle will. And so on startup. Yeah, particularly on startup. So you, you're, you're likely to be needing, um, you know, to draw in electricity from the from the grid. Uh, over and above what you're going to be able to get from a battery. Um, there's just a question often that crops up about um, sort of regulation in the market uh, regarding battery systems. So whether it's a heat battery or whether it's an electrical battery, um, obviously all of these items need to pass the British standards. They need to pass any sort of legal sort of regulations in there. Um, where there's maybe a difference with renewable systems is in, at the moment there isn't a separate sort of code um, and set of standards that, uh, for example, exists for a solar PV system. Um, our understanding is that these things are being looked at, but uh, the current state of play is that there's nothing currently in place. So what we would always always mention is that, you know, uh, when you're going out and investigating these sorts of systems, find out what um, the manufacturer warranties are, what their guidelines are, um, with regards um, installers of those systems, what those manufacturers expect of installers and what training they've undertaken. Um, and there's potentially, potentially consumer protection um, elements in place there. So there's consumer bodies who deal with renewables, for example, the Renewable Energy Consumer Code um, and HIES, their consumer codes for renewables. And they have elements of them that also cover consumer protection issues around energy storage and the installation of batteries. Um, HIES. Um, so um, we would we would suggest you you investigate those as well and speak to installers about um, what um, for, in particular around what um, estimates they are providing to you around savings um, as Peter was mentioning earlier how have they calculated that based on your very specific um, scenario for example when you're in and when you're out when you're using um, power when you're not the size of the system that you're anticipating putting in, etc. Um, Peter, a question, or maybe Pantelis actually, um, a question that often crops up is how long will a battery last and, and how does that change depending on the, the type of electrical battery that you have? Um, would you be able to provide uh, yeah, some information sure. uh, on that? It really depends on the battery technology. Uh, lithium ion intend to last longer than lead acid. However, uh, most of the products are based on lithium ion. And also it depends on the usage. Uh, if you use a battery for one cycle per day, uh, I'll say that uh, it can last for 10 years. But uh, if uh, you install a battery in a very sunny location in the UK and you can charge and discharge the battery more than one time per day, one more than one type per day, then uh, the lifespan of the battery will last uh, less. I don't know if that's... Okay, thank you, Pantelis. Yeah, anything to Just come in, come in, in here. here. It's quite important to look at what warranty is offered on batteries. Um, some give a um, guarantee based on time and some give a guarantee based on charge cycle. Um, you may find that somebody can't even give you a definition of what a charge cycle is. Uh, some of the higher end batteries also say 10 years or an amount of energy flow through the battery. 
and this will be in megawatts. Batteries do uh, degrade over time and you may even find that one will um, say the battery will still have X percent of capacity at a certain age. Uh, when you're looking at sizing a system in the first instance, you may want to take that into account uh, and slightly oversize the system on the basis that that may give you a longer life that at eight or 10 years, the usable capacity of the battery still meets the needs of the property. Um, but again, be very careful in looking at what the small print is in defining, especially what is meant by a charge cycle. To my mind, it's from completely empty to completely full to completely empty. Now, in a lot of cases, um, that may not be the case. A battery may be half full when it starts to be charged, or equally, it, it could be completely empty and only charged to half full. So um, it, it's something that is not maybe as clear as it should be. Uh, if a battery has a time warranty as opposed to a charge cycle warranty, uh, at least it's a little clearer. Thanks, Peter. Um, and, and just for balance, uh, with regards to the sort of the heat batteries that I was mentioning that produce sort of mains pressure hot water, the one we're aware of on the market at the moment, there only seems to be one, is from a company called Sunamp. Um, and they believe that there's no degradation of their system over, and I think they're into the tens of thousands of cycles. So these are the sorts of things that you need to discuss with those with the manufacturers or the installers to provide evidence of of what they're claiming um, and reassure yourselves as to as to the type of system that you're considering. Um, we're unfortunately running out of time for the webinar, uh, so it was really just uh, I was going to finish with some some next steps, um, and, and it's the sort of obvious stuff really. Um, do your research, work out whether you actually want heat. Um, from uh, that's going to be most useful to you or whether electricity is going to be most useful to you, or maybe both. Um, investigate which renewable systems the storage unit is going to work with and you're going to make, need to make some considerations then about how the system is designed and how your system will charge. Um, understand your rights as a consumer and the standards that installers should meet. Um, so as I mentioned there's many guidelines there's obviously best practice uh, for example there's a guide from the IET that talks about best practice for installers um, and they can choose to meet those best practice guidelines or not that's up to them um, obviously what you demand of them is 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 within the contract that you will have with them and as I mentioned there's also consumer codes um, that provide a level of consumer protection as well and whether you use an installer who has signed up to one of those consumer codes um, Prepare questions, um, and as I mentioned before, how any financial benefits are calculated and sort of reassure yourself as to how those calculations have been done and what assumptions have been made. Um, and then we always recommend you get a, a range of quotes and compare not only the costs, but the service that you're being provided and the ongoing support thereafter, because sometimes cheapest isn't always best. You need to be able to compare across and what's most important to you. Um, and then also check what financial support may be available before going ahead. So obviously for renewables, there's um, loans from the Scottish government um, that are available, as well as um, from the UK government, you can get paid for the renewable heat or the renewable electricity you generate. Um, at present, there's uh, not financial support were available for domestic energy storage systems. However, that position could change as the government's obviously review what support they provide on an ongoing basis. Um, yeah, and as Pantelis pointed out, you know, it's useful to have a sense of what's coming in the future. Some of this stuff you may not want to bank on now. You, you probably want to make the case as to, to how it will benefit you now, but there may be further benefits to you in the future if you've got a system. Um, as for further support, um, there's Home Energy Scotland. So this is Scottish government funded independent and impartial advice service. Um, there's specialists there who can talk to you about renewables and, and energy storage and they'll tailor that advice for you in your home and they'll give you some um, advice on suitability, you know, getting quotes, potential savings that you may be able to make and then direct you. Um, the next stage would be going in and speaking to installers. Um, and for people who may already have a system, we're looking for people um, who can join our Green Homes Network. 
This is a network of homeowners who've actually installed um, renewable systems, energy efficiency improvements in their home. We're actually actively seeking homeowners who've got energy storage systems who would be happy for there to be a case study on, on the Energy Saving Trust website and would also be happy for um, other householders to be put in contact with them so they can talk over the phone or potentially even have other homeowners come around and have a look at their system and speak to them face to face. Be brilliant if you could contact us um, if you're able to do that. Um, and obviously there's other websites out there beyond ours. So as I mentioned, the Renewable Energy Consumer Code and HIES are consumer codes. Um, the Micro Generation Certification Scheme um, manufacturers who are out there producing this and the IET who've got this best practice guide for installers. Um, and there's basically uh, a li um, the phone number for Home Energy Scotland. Um, get in touch with them to, to find out more. As I mentioned, it's independent, it's impartial, it's a free phone line, it's Scottish Government funded. Um, so um, if you want to find out about upcoming webinars, you can follow our events page on the website. Um, we will be doing more in the coming months. Uh, and if you've got any ideas about topics you'd like us to cover, then drop us a line and we'll see if we can accommodate that. Um, so just a final thank you um, from me to you for attending. And thank you, um, huge thanks to Peter and Pantelis who've joined us today. Um, Goodbye, and I hope you tune in for some of our future webinars. Thank you.